So my name is Liam Dillon. I'm a reporter at the Los Angeles Times, but it's actually it's wonderful to be back in San Diego. Um, I worked for many years at Voice of San Diego, and it's just uh, I remember being at the first Politifest in in 2011, and it's amazing to see how uh, how it's grown, and to have to see also so many people that I recognize and had such fond memories of. So um, this is going to be fun. Uh, so we'll start. Uh, I cover have covered housing issues for the LA Times for about three and a half years. Worked predominantly out of Sacramento, uh, just moved to Los Angeles to continue covering the issue more from a neighborhood perspective, perspective rather, than a, rather than a legislative one. Um, but I know a lot about what's been going on uh, at the Capitol uh, and around the state on this issue. And I'm going to kind of start here with a, a primer um, before we bring up our guests on the state of housing supply or maybe housing supply and its uh, discontents when it comes to solving the housing crisis in the state. So let's start. So here's the problem, um, and folks who uh, are buying or renting in California probably know this very well. Um, for the price of one home in the state, you could buy the average home in the United States twice. Um, these numbers, uh, median home value is uh, close to $600,000, which is nearly two and a half times the national average, and median rental of Twenty-five forty-two is more. It's a thousand dollars a month more than the national average. Some eagle-eyed folks might see that actually the bar graph doesn't quite line up with the numbers in the in the in the in the on the side there. But you know, I have a pretty small graphics budget, so here we are. <laughs> okay, so that seems like a problem. But what does this actually mean? Well, it means that California has the nation's highest poverty rate. And how can that be? Right? Uh, we have huge, huge, huge wealth. Well, there are actually two measures of poverty that the U.S. Census uses, uh, and the kind of better measure that actually takes into account people's experiences on the ground include um, cost of living. And by that metric, uh, California does indeed have the highest poverty rate in the country. More than one in six residents are living in poverty. We also in the state now have the lowest homeownership rate since World War II. Nearly a quarter of the nation's homeless population, uh, the last count had it at about, about 130,000 residents statewide, uh, but you'll almost certainly see that number go up when the new figures come out uh, at the end of the year, beginning of next. And just for context, California has 12% of the nation's population overall. Uh, 1.5 million California families pay more than half their income on rent. That's the definition of severely rent burdened, and so a huge number of uh, residents are in that situation. And, uh, you know, if people are spending so much of their money on housing, they're not spending it on other things. And as a result, we see, by a variety of estimates, at least a $100 billion drag annually on the state's economy as a result of the housing problems we have. So and it looks like it's getting worse. Um, here are some of the recent uh, figures you see from areas around the state on, on homelessness. I mentioned, you know, the overall 130,000 number, which is getting bigger. Uh, but San Francisco, their recent count, up 30%. We're close to 10,000 people there. Alameda County, where we're Oakland and other areas in uh, the East Bay, uh, up 43%. LA County, 12% uh, to 59,000 people, which is, you know, a mid-sized city in LA and, and San Diego and many other places around the state. So how did we get here? Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is the rent is too damn high guy, uh, who deservedly is uh, pretty famous these days. Uh, hopefully we can get further if this clicker works. There we go. Okay, so um, one main issue, and this speaks to the heart of this panel, is California does not build housing like it used to. You'll see in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we had a significant amount of, uh, of new building in this state. And the, you know, ever since that a bit of a boom in the early 2000s, even though we're in an economic expansion now, we're not seeing that, uh, that same level of, of production. That bl black line there, how much we need to build to meet demand, that's the official estimate from the state housing department, says that simply to meet population growth, we need 180,000 units uh, being built every year. As you can see, that number has not been reached since the mid, uh, like looks like 2005. We also don't fund, uh, fund affordable housing in the state, the extent to which it's needed. Uh, there was a thought experiment done a few years ago by the Legislative Analyst Office, that's kind of a nonpartisan uh, outfit in, in the state capitol. 
that says simply to fund new housing for the most sort of vulnerable renters, those who are low-income folks paying more than half of their income on rent, it would take a bond that to service that debt would cost between 15 billion and 30 billion every single year for the next 30 years. We currently spend a fraction of that amount. And again, that's just simply to build new, new housing for folks who are the most vulnerable. Also, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, I think and generally speaking, when folks think about housing subsidy, they think about, say, Section 8, or they think about um, you know, funding for construction for low-income development. They don't actually realize or understand that w in this country and in this state, we subsidize homeowners to a significant amount, uh, uh, 15 times more than we, at least in California, than we do renters, predominantly through things like the mortgage interest deduction. And so I think people need to keep that in mind when thinking about housing subsidy is that actually homeowners get uh, a lot more of it. And then um, while there is a shortage of homes overall in the state, as the last graph showed, there's a much bigger shortage of homes for those making low and middle income. So the governor, um, uh, new governor came into office the beginning of, of last year, or th this year rather. Uh, he's called for the building of 3.5 million homes between now and 2025. Uh, that means 500,000 new homes a year. And for some context, you can see the upper right-hand corner, that's kind of where Gavin is up there. Um, that's absolutely to scale, so for those who are checking. Um, so, so um, you know, obviously this is a huge, uh, promising a huge in increase in, in housing production. He also called for a Marshall Plan for affordable housing. And so his promises to address the underlying housing supply issues in the state could not be more ambitious than, 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 than what he's laid out. So what does the research say? Um, generally speaking, when you're talking about housing supply, there's a consensus among the academic experts that building more at an aggregate level, like a metropolitan region, so the whole San Diego region or the whole LA region or what have you, um, generally helps ameliorate housing cost pressures. And that's, that's the same whether it's um, you know, market rate housing or uh, deed restricted affordable housing. In general, at the aggregate level, what the research says is more building helps deal with cost pressures. However, um, there is less data and, and facts about what happens at a neighborhood level when it comes to housing costs. So if you center development only in a particular place, particular community, particular neighborhood, uh, there's less um, consensus on what that might mean for housing costs in that area and also for issues like gentrification and displacement. So um, how would the governor actually try to meet those big housing goals? Um, well. He's going to ha would have to take on some sacred cows or third rails um, in the state. And uh, that is, will be the thing that we will be talking about with our great panelists. So first, here's where you can find me, um, uh, my Twitter handle, email. And then I have a uh, podcast I co-host with a colleague based in, in Sacramento called Gimme Shelter, which also has the benefit of being the best Rolling Stone song. Um, and so you can check that out every other week. And, and even better, we're actually going to be doing a live version of the podcast later on today here. So with that, uh, I'm going to bring up our four guests to talk about um, housing supply. We will start with um, Elise Lowe, who works for the city of San Diego. And now Ray Major from Sandag. Maya Roses of the Yimby Democrats of San Diego. And State Senator Scott Weiner from San Francisco. I think you have to flip the mics on. So, Ray, my presentation was very much kind of state-specific, right? And I'm hoping that you could get a little bit into um, some more San Diego uh, uh, numbers in this regard. So could you explain some of the imbalance between job growth and, and housing growth in San Diego in recent years? Sure. So um, when you take a look at the San Diego numbers or the, the graph that Liam put up, uh, the San Diego graph looks pretty much the same. We haven't kept up with the amount of housing that we need to build. Um, since the bottom of the Great Recession. And so uh, we're growing at about 27,000 jobs per year. We have about 30,000 
people who are coming into the region or, or just have natural increase. We have more people here in the region. And we're building somewhere around 6,000 housing units, 7,000 housing units a year. So that's like one housing unit for every four to five people who come into the region. Um, we are right now probably at a deficit of about 63,000 housing units just since this last economic cycle. When you do take a look at other things like Airbnbs, we, we've lost about 14,000 units just from people taking those housing units off the market and using them for short-term rentals. There's 14,000 there and another 27,000 second homes in the region that are uh, basically people's second homes so they're not really available to rent. So we're probably short about 100,000 units in, in the region right now. Um, uh, go to Senator Weiner. Um, you're known for introducing a, a legislation that would aims to increase um, housing production across the state. Could you explain what um, what Senate Bill 50 would do? There we go. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, sure. <clears throat> so. Um, the goal of Senate Bill 50 is to help put us on the road to close uh, California's uh, three and a half million home uh, housing shortage. Uh, and to make sure that as we build the millions of homes that we need in California, uh, that we are not doing sprawl. Uh, because the last thing we need is to continue to do what we've been doing, which is, okay, we're not gonna build enough housing, and the housing we do build, we'll just build it further and further and further out and cover up farmland and open space and clog the freeways and force people into multi-hour commutes and undermine our own uh, carbon emission goals. And so we need to build that housing and let's not build it far away, let's not build it in wildfire zones, let's build it in our exist in infill. Uh, near public transportation, near jobs. So the bill um, will, and it's a very non-controversial, easy bill. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it sets basic um, baseline standards for local zoning. We have traditionally in California allowed cities to do whatever zoning they want to do with some very uh, weak uh, state standards. Uh, and so what we've seen is upwards of uh, as much as 75% of California is zoned for only single family homes, meaning that all multi-unit is prohibited. Uh, and that's true in job centers, it's true by major public transportation. Uh, and so the bill will say if you're within a half a mile of fixed rail, quarter mile of um, high frequency bus service, or in a job rich area, uh, a city cannot put a cap on density. You can't say only R1 or R2. Uh, and if it's within a half a mile of fixed rail, you can't push the height limit between four or five stories. Uh, this bill also um, allows statewide uh, by right fourplex uh, so that um, you could turn a single family home, if it's big enough, uh, into a duplex or triplex or fourplex, not by tearing it down, but by doing an interior. Uh, renovation. Uh, the bill also has strong tenant anti-demolition protections because we don't want this to be a tool of sort of wiping away existing housing and pushing people out. Uh, and it has some inclusionary standards. Um, it does preserve a lot of local decision making around the approval process for individual projects, local design standards, uh, for the most part local height limits, local setbacks, local demolition restrictions, and so forth. So it's not eliminating local decision making contrary to what some of the opponents of the bill say, and it does not encourage demolition. What it does allow is to build more housing where it should be. So how, how would your bill uh, change San Diego? Um, so uh, San Diego, uh, uh, so San Diego has uh, transit. Um, and so in the areas uh, around uh, the, um, the late rail, um, around the, the train stations, uh, there would, it would be zoned for more density within a half a mile. Um, for the high frequency bus stops uh, and high frequency bus service, it's a pretty high standard. It has to be uh, 12 minute headways during rush hour uh, and then has to have um, uh, uh, consistent service from early morning into the evening and service seven days a week. So this isn't about those buses that are coming, you know, once an hour and, or only or only during rush hour. It has to be real, you know, seven day a week good bus service. Um, would be uh, the density would be relaxed. Um, I I think um, I, 
about 60% of San Diego is zoned for single family or thereabouts. That's what I've been told. Uh, they're nodding, so maybe I'm right. Uh, and so in not in all of those areas, but in, in, in parts of those single family areas, um, small to mid-size um, multi-unit would be allowed. Um, it would largely be subject to whatever the local height limit is. So if the local height limit is 30 feet, uh, you know, you could do um, a three-story uh, building. Um, so, and then as with the rest of the state, people would be able to turn buildings into um, duplex, triplex, fourplex. Um, if it's a vacant lot, you could build a fourplex. I should say that uh, because we have now finally, hopefully, um, made clear what we've been trying to make clear for 37 years, that cities must allow ADUs. That was the law passed in the early 80s, and cities, including my own city of San Francisco, ignored it for decades. Um, we've now uh, made crystal clear and closed a lot of the loopholes mandating that cities allow both an ADU and a junior ADU. Uh, so we already have a form of statewide triplex in California, although it's limited because there are limitations on ADUs. So the statewide fourplex in SB 50 is still very impactful, um, but it's, it's not um, as impactful as before because we've already gone part of the way uh, there. Um, Elise, um, Mayor Faulkner made a big deal uh, about calling himself a YIMBY. Um, he's put forward a number of things at the beginning of the year that aim to increase housing supply, especially near transit. Uh, how's that going? Um, it's actually going really well. Um, there's going to be an environmental document released soon so that um, we, the city can put forward to the city council for approval. Um, essentially, in exchange for affordable housing on site in transit areas, unlimited um, density, so unlimited height, um, that would be a huge game changer. It um, would actually go a little bit further than what you're describing in SB 50 for those specific areas, but it also would require um, uh, <clears throat> community benefits um, in exchange for this. So it's really trying to look at all of the different needs of the community and not just height, 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 but how do we provide additional community benefits in exchange for that. So um, I think that that's gonna be uh, quite a, a game changer. There's also been um, proposals put forward for different income levels of housing, so um, a moderate housing density uh, bonus, which I know a number of developers are looking forward to having that come forward. They wanna build at different income levels. They might not be able to have the financing to build at a very low or low, but looking at that moderate level, that missing middle where we haven't seen a lot of that development. So um, there's a number of proposals that uh, reflect our development um, impact fees, uh, changes to that methodology, which will make it um, so that we can incentivize smaller units and more of them. Um, essentially, right now, a developer, when they come in to pay an impact fee, they pay on a unit, no matter the unit size. Well, if you have to pay more for a higher unit size, that's going to incentivize the smaller units. So that's another proposal that the city's working on. And um, you know, we've worked really hard within the city, not only at the policy level, but within my department, the development services department that does all the permitting to change our policies and process so that we can reduce the amount of time that it takes to, because we know that time is money and we don't want the money and the expenses incurred by developers passed on to the folks that are buying the unit. So I'm doing everything I can to try to um, uh, revolutionize the process. Um, to my knowledge, the mayor here has not proposed any changes to single family areas. Um, why not? Um, that's right. So um, the type of unlimited um, height he does not feel would be appropriate in a single family neighborhood, but he's been very supportive of the ADU um, and we've even put forward um, waivers, fee waivers, and financial incentives. So um, with the community plan updates that the city has undergone over the last couple years, we have actually greatly densified many neighborhoods. There is still single family residential in some of them, but for the most part, um, we've added by right 60,000 units in San Diego. And by the time we're done updating community plans, it'll be 100,000 units. And then with density bonus, that's gonna get San Diego to an additional by right 200,000 units of housing supply in existing neighborhoods. 
So I just want to push on this a little bit and open it up for for everyone. Um, you know, is someone what what to to everyone's mind and the, the panel is the best defense of uh, single family only zoning, um, and what is the the best argument against it? I'll just say one thing before I let everyone else talk. Sorry, um, community character. So that's something that we ought to just have a panel about and talk about. Um, having that be a part of um, environmental analysis and CEQA and community character, we are essentially allowing that, oh, we can't change the neighborhood at all because of community character. And that's worth debate, right? Because for years, that level of let's have community character be every house should look the same. And that's what's growing and evolving, and I think that that's presenting um, obstacles and challenges uh, to the development that we so greatly need. Um, if you take a look at the San Diego region, and most of it right now is single family housing, and if you, that, and you look at that as the urban footprint, uh, we need to add another 700,000 people in the, by 2050. That's what our population growth is going to be. And with that, maybe another 400,000 housing units in the same urban footprint. So we really need to absolutely rethink what housing looks like in the region, and we really need to, if you wanna meet the greenhouse gas uh, goals and also the VMT goals, we're going to have to fundamentally take a look at, at how we can build housing around transit and, and densify, but we, we need to do it from a, a regional perspective, because there's no way that you can put, cram that many more people into the region without having uh, high density housing around transit, so. I'll add to the pile on <laughs> against single family housing. Uh, there, there is really no excuse for single family um, housing to be zoned within transit priority areas, within the areas that Senator Weiner is talking about. Um, there is just no excuse for um, our communities to be built to exclude so many people to be living near our public infrastructure, our transit network. And so I think that should be a really big priority for everyone is to make sure that we allow for more people to live near transit so that they can have access to get around, to get to their job, to get to school um, and without a car. It's, it just, it's, it's so needed. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, um, I, I don't think there's uh, any way to defend single family mandates. So I think when you say single family zoning, people sometimes think that it means it's okay to build single family there. Um, but it's important for people to understand that single family zoning is a mandate to only build single family homes and it's a ban on apartment buildings and it's effectively a ban on affordable subsidized housing for low income people because with very rare exceptions, no one's building affordable subsidized single family homes. It has to be multi-unit to pencil out. Um, and this isn't about whether we like or don't like single family homes. I grew up in a single family home. It was great. Single, there's a lot of people want to live in single family homes, uh, and that's great. Uh, but the reality is two things. Uh, increasingly, uh, you know, maybe a lot of pe people look at polling, like so many people want to live in single family. For a large majority of San Diegans, uh, and increasingly uh, California as a whole, people can't afford to live in a single family home. And so it is incredibly exclusionary. It means you have to only be above a certain income to be able to live in this community. Um, it creates a huge math problem, because if you're gonna say, particularly in our urban areas where the jobs are, where the transit is, every parcel is only allowed to have one unit, plus, say, an ADU, that creates an inherent math problem in terms of filling um, <clears throat> our housing deficit. And when we allow it near the jobs and transit, all we're doing is inducing sprawl. So it's not about getting rid of single family homes. It's always gonna be a big market for single family homes. It's about legalizing other forms of housing and having that mix. And sometimes it gets portrayed as, if you, re, if you allow density in a single family neighborhood, that means I'm gonna have a 30 floor apartment building next to my house. And we're not talking about eliminating all height limits. Some people would like that. I, I don't, that's not what I'm advocating. You can have a reasonable height limit that preserves quote unquote community character in terms of the look and feel, but it has three or four or six or 10 units in it instead of just one. Uh, so that's I think what we're talking about. So I'm gonna come back to try to defend single family if I can in a moment, but I, I wanna ask um, Maya a question first. Uh, so um, 
to my knowledge, a bunch of EMB organizations sprung up in recent years across the state, across the country, uh, in, in fact. To my knowledge, most are nonpartisan. Um, however, yours is not. And, and I'm, I'm wondering why, especially in a region, you know, here is much more conservative than a lot of the others in California. Well, that's exactly why. So the, my, the EMB group that I co-founded in 2018, early 2018. It's called the YIMBY Democrats of San Diego County. We have a booth outside if anyone wants to join. Uh, and um, we started a Democratic club. I, I, we are the first Democratic club that um, is a YIMBY identified uh, club. The reason why we did that is exactly because San Diego is, is more of a conservative purple town or county. And while the trend is definitely shifting towards becoming more democratic, we see it in this election cycle for 2020 in the city of San Diego. Um, it's important that uh, we look at the candidates based on how they're responding to the most pressing issues. And in San Diego, I'd say that is absolutely housing and homelessness. And uh, we need to make sure that while we're electing more progressive people, which is uh, what I support, um, they need to support more housing. And so the function of, well, first of all, um, YIMBY, in case anyone is not familiar, YIMBY stands for Yes in My Backyard. The concept behind this movement is that um, our elected officials need to hear from us that we support them making the tough decisions. They usually, uh, at a public hearing, will get dozens of people showing up speaking against new housing, whether it's affordable, permanent supportive housing for homeless people, or um, market rate housing. And they get so many people coming out against it. Very few people coming out in support who are not the developers themselves. And so the idea with uh, being a YIMBY is that uh, people who really care about the future, about having housing for their children or grandchildren, uh, our, our, our decision makers need to hear from us and need to know that they have constituents who support them doing the right thing. And so the next obvious step to me, besides showing up to a hearing, is starting a democratic club where we can officially endorse candidates and encourage them to do the right thing, encourage them to develop their positions uh, and their campaign based on being pro-housing, pro-building enough housing for our future. And then um, we support them. Uh, we, we walk and donate to these candidates and um, of course hold them accountable if need be. So um, I, I, I think our club has done a really great job of um, making being a YIMBY a popular idea amongst Democrats and uh, we're gonna keep pushing so that we have, um, we make sure that our Democratic candidates and electeds are YIMBYs and support the movement. So I'm going to come back one more time to the single family thing, and then I'm going to let it go. And 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 the reason why I'm doing it is be, one one because we talked about the large percentage of the region that actually is dominated by single family residential, and also the fact that everyone here um, def, um, wants to seems to get rid of that. Um, and so I I you know when I talk to folks who are living in those communities who are defenders of it, they they often express concerns about a lack of infrastructure to handle growth, not enough parking, references to community or neighborhood character. And so to reframe the question or the issue this way, what objections to growth do you think are legitimate and what aren't? And this is for, for, for everyone. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, uh, first of all, what, one thing I do wanna uh, just note, so the, this year um, around SB50 and its predecessor SB827, there was this narrative that, oh my God, this is a super unpopular bill. Everyone hates this bill. I have some colleagues in the legislature would say, everyone in my district hates this bill. And I would say, you know, I, I think that's not the case. Um, people are self-selecting in terms of who's showing up at town halls, emailing, going to city council meetings and yelling and carrying on. Um, and uh, all of a sudden we had a poll in San Francisco because in our mayor's race, um, only one candidate came out in favor of SBA 2-7, uh, and she won. And shortly before the election, there was a poll, and they put, they, they polled, you know, the, the idea of this bill, and it polled at 75%. Um, this year, there have been three statewide polls um, on uh, SB 50, asked in all in somewhat different ways, but all pretty blunt in terms of what the bill does. And they polled between 61 and 66 percent, polling majority vote in every single region of the state, um, every demographic, higher among communities of color, but still 
high among white people, um, higher among young people, but still majority support among people over 50, and majority support among homeowners. So I think most people um, get it. In terms of limits on growth, what I would say is, um, it, you know, it, and people sometimes say, well, it, California's full, or San Diego's full, or San Francisco's full. There's a lot of people who have pronounced that we're full, or my neighborhood is full. And so, you know, the government should somehow acknowledge that. And I, I think as government, and for me, just as an elected official or just as a human being, it's, it's none of my business where people want to move. And it's none of government's business where people want to move. People want to move somewhere, they have a right to move there. And that's what California has always been about. And so the idea that we would say, oh, the growth is too much, we have to stop it. Well, we, we've tried that. We went 50 years where we made it impossible to build enough housing, and our housing production collapsed. You saw those numbers. And guess what happened over that period? Our population went up by a lot. People come anyway, and it just causes all sorts of problems that we haven't built the housing. So yes, the limits on growth, in my mind, we should not be building in the highest wildfire risk areas. We should not be focusing on sprawl and, and destroying farmlands and clogging up the freeways. We should be focusing the growth, and that means rezoning, including rezoning single-family neighborhoods. And I'll add to that, um, but I think it's important to make clear that actually in San Diego, at least, and you can confirm this, that most of our population growth into the future is just from San Diegans having children. It's not necessarily people moving here in search of a job. Certainly there's tons of those, but it's just us as a growing region. And so who are, who are these new homes for? It's just for us and for our children. And I hear from plenty of parents that they don't want their kids living in, in their house until they're th in their 30s, right? <laughs> um, so, and I would agree with everything that Senator Weiner just said about where we do not want housing. As a YIMBY, I say yes, but I say yes to making sure that we're building in exactly the right places. Uh, that's, of course, near transit, in our urban areas, and that's especially near jobs um, so that we can reduce those vehicle miles traveled and hopefully get more people riding transit um, where that's available. But. Um, the reason why, another reason why we started the YIMBY Democrats as a, a democratic club is because there's a history of segregation that's real, that's racial and class segregation that has happened across this country and in San Diego. And that happens through zoning. And there's a history of redlining. There's some uh, great literature out there about it that I won't try to explain in depth. But we need to be um, adding more housing in these exclusionary single family neighborhoods especially the ones that have great access to public resources, such as the good school districts, such as the beaches, such as parks. And that's another reason why it is so, so crucial to be adding more housing, even in single family zoned neighborhoods, um, and make sure that we have enough zones capacity for that type of housing um, there and not in the back country, not in, in the fire zones. And and I would like to just build on what Maya said and get back to my roots um, as a former executive director of a nonprofit that advocated for better public transit. I think that that access to resources and access to jobs, but um, around the transportation discussion, we just we're, we're full on ready to make that shift in the sort of paradigm of how we build but we haven't quite fulfilled an achievement to make that shift um, on the transportation side. Uh, we're definitely at the verge of it. We've got great folks here from Sandag and Hassan with his five big moves, which are starting that shift, and that's pretty amazing. But when I hear the senator talk about high capacity transit running at, um, my definition, I thought it used to be 10 minutes, but you said 12 minute, um, uh, running times for, for buses and seven days a week, I remember, evaluating projects to say what would be a great project to go in next to transit, we're like, oh, this one's perfect. Oh, but the transit only runs Monday through Friday, so on Saturdays and Sundays. So we're, we're gonna be depending a lot on that, and City of San Diego has already made a huge shift by reducing the required parking for new development in transit areas 
but um, you know, we, we need to continue to build on the um, access to transportation alternatives um, in order to really uh, fulfill that gap. And that will continue to be a point of contention from folks who are um, NIMBY or don't wanna see the additional growth because um, the streets will fill up with cars if we are not um, providing access to alternatives and everyone continues to drive. Yeah, Lynn, if I could just, uh, you, you mentioned also the infrastructure issue, yeah. which, is, which is a really important one. Um, I think the, the, the reliance on we don't have enough infrastructure as an argument against new housing is one of the greatest red herring arguments in politics and certainly in housing politics. Yes, absolutely, it's, we, you don't wanna just build housing. You want to make sure that your your transit and your schools and your libraries and your sewer system and your water system that everything is keeping up. Absolutely, you can't just you know look at it as one. These are all integrated issues, and I'm a huge supporter of uh, infrastructure investment increases. And California, like the rest of the country, has sort of um, fallen down on that. Although we're starting to turn it around, um, <clears throat> but the the notion that you can't build housing until you, you have to like perfect all of the infrastructure into this beautiful, perfect, heavenly thing. And then you can plop the housing down in the middle of it. That's just not how the real world works. And with the exception of, of those hyper-planned communities where you like build everything from scratch, putting that aside, because that's the exception, when you look at how cities and towns all over the state and country form, it's not like, do the infrastructure first and then we'll put the housing there. It's, it's a little bit of like, you play catch up, the housing gets ahead, this gets ahead, this falls behind. More people move there, they build housing, then there's demand for more infrastructure, so you do the infrastructure. It's not perfect. I would love for the infrastructure to be perfected as the housing is built, but it, it's just not as neat as that. And that's not the, his, the history of human existence is you have to play catch up sometimes and populations shift around. Um, so yes, we must, must, must prioritize modernizing and improving our infrastructure, not just our publicly owned, um, also that disaster known as PG&E. We have to, you know, uh, it's private companies too that have in critical infrastructure. Um, so we just have to do better, but it can't inhibit housing. And the reality is, even without the infrastructure, people still move in the communities and go send their kids to school and use the water and use the streets. But it might be that they are living three families to a unit, or it might be that they're living in their car, or it might be that they're paying 70% of their income for housing and so effectively living in poverty. So they're already using the infrastructure, so let's just have enough housing. So you may recall the slide that as part of the presentation that talked about how uh, at an aggregate level, the academic research suggests that more housing supply is good to limit or, or perhaps even in some cases lower um, housing costs, but that, that research is less clear and specific in individual neighborhoods. So how do you take into account communities at risk of gentrification and displacement when you're talking about proposals to add supply? That's for anybody. Um, preservation, housing preservation of existing affordable units um, has continued to be a major issue um, within the city of San Diego. I know our council president, Georgette Gomez, put forth a housing preservation um, strategy and the sort of policy conundrum of that is do you, um, what's gonna be the biggest overall benefit for, for San Diegans? Is it preserve older, perhaps even potentially substandard, affordable housing units because they are, or, and, and most of them often sometimes are low density, or do you bring in new units, last longer, higher density, and that's something that the city of San Diego has been wrestling with um, for a year. There's definitely different uh, strategies that that have the potential to protect neighborhoods. We always said that gentrification in itself isn't bad, but the displacement that follows um, is, and so that is, um, a real issue, and I think that um, as we look going forward to what's, what's right for San Diegans, we're gonna have to 
continue little by little providing that balance. And it's, you know, having those policy discussions, realizing it can't be one way or another. It has to be a little bit of each. And as we're making policy decisions, we have to be able to reflect on that. So I just wanted to um, make sure we touched on that. I'll just add that um, I think commonly it's portrayed that there's the YIMBYs and then there's the, the tenants organizers and the people on the tenant side. And, um, and I think that that fundamentally is not the right way of looking at it. I think YIMBYs, uh, we want to have it all. We want to protect tenants immediately um, because there's, we should not uh, allow for people to be displaced. Um, but we long term need to be working on the, the solution that um, requires building enough housing for everyone. Long term, the only way we're going to fix the housing crisis if, is if there is abundant housing um, and we're not being stretched so thin. And so a big part of how YIMBYs are working on this is again focusing on increasing the capacity to build housing, um, especially affordable housing in, um, in exclusionary zoned areas as well as in um, tr traditionally more wealthy neighborhoods even if they are multifamily like Bankers Hill uh, and supporting housing projects that include affordable on site um, and that ultimately will be able to desegregate communities and make San Diego more affordable long term um, by building more housing and protecting uh, renters. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, I com completely agree with that. In terms of the, the YIMBY movement, I think early on there were some uh, uh, voices in the YIMBY movement that were uh, had a very libertarian um, bent, and it was just about supply, supply, supply. Um, and I think that has quickly that quickly changed. And the YIMBYs I know, and I know many YIMBYs in San Francisco and statewide, are some of the most lefty people I know. On my Senate campaign in 2016, um, I think I was um, just about the only uh, Hillary Clinton supporter uh, on my t campaign team. I have very super Yimby field organizers, and they were all strong Bernie people. And now they're either Bernie or Elizabeth Warren. So they're, these are really progressive people who do not want to see people getting evicted and do not want to see low-income and working-class people being pushed out. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, it is absolutely the case that for the long run, to structurally fix the problem, we have to have a huge increase in supply. And ultimately, the shortage of housing is the number one, is the top driver of displacement. When you have a shortage and scarcity, and prices explode, and there's an incentive for landlords to push people out. But in the, for, but for the immediate problem, we have to have strong anti-displacement measures. Um, <clears throat> we have to protect renters. And we just passed, um, and I apologize for my voice, but um, <clears throat> we just passed AB 1482 this year, um, a renter protection bill, which was, would be unimaginable three or four years ago to pass in the legislature. It would have died in its first committee. Um, but it places a statewide rent cap, 5% plus CPI, statewide, without overriding more protective local ordinances, and statewide just cause. And it's, uh, again, I, I, it still blows my mind that it actually passed, and I was a co-author of it, and I was happy to support it. Um, it's incredible that it passed. Um, so we have to be keeping people in the housing that they have. When you look at those spikes in homelessness, it's not because all of a sudden more people are mentally ill now than there were two years ago, or there's more addiction now than there was two years ago. Yes, mental health and addiction are factors in homelessness. That spike is because people are getting evicted from their apartments, getting pushed out, and they have nowhere to go, and they don't want to move to Denver. They want to stay in their community, and so now they're couch surfing or living in a car or living in a shelter. Um, so we, we have to make sure that we are not allowing mass demolition of rental housing in particular, and that when there is displacement, that it is temporary displacement, so you have a rate of return, which we've seen in some projects in San Francisco. If you take a small building and you want to turn it into a much bigger one, and those tenants are taken care of or put somewhere else temporarily, not paying more rent, and then have a right to return at the same rent. So there are different tools that we can use, but it has to be part of the conversation. I, I want to push us a little bit more on, on this question and, and frame it this way. Um, 
oftentimes when people see cranes in the sky in their neighborhood um, uh, or in other neighborhoods around the city or the region they're in, they see housing coming that they believe isn't for them, meaning it's too expensive for them to, for them to live in. Um, are they wrong? And what do you do about that? This is why housing politics is so hard. So when you, when you spend uh, 50 years uh, systematically not building enough housing and designing rules to make it harder and harder to build housing, and so you accumulate a multi-million home deficit, uh, you can't fix that overnight. I wish that there were a way, say, we're gonna do this, and within three years, you know, California, we're gonna solve our affordability problem. If I, you know, any politician that tells you that it, it has a bridge to sell you to, it's gonna take a long time. Um, and, uh, and what that means is, okay, you have a huge, huge deficit, so we're gonna build our first 100,000 homes. Well, you build those first homes, it's not like that's gonna collapse the cost of housing. They're gonna be expensive, because you have scarcity. And that is hard because people say, okay, you're building this housing and, it, and it's really expensive, it's not for me. It's luxury housing. Everything that's not subsidized gets branded as luxury housing because it's expensive. Well, guess what? The 50-year-old apartments are also super expensive. The 100-year-old apartments are also super, everything is expensive, not because it's luxury, but because there's not enough of it. And so the, that makes the politics really, really hard. And people say, oh, God, you're building, I see the cranes. My, they took parking spaces away because of the construction. It's really annoying. And it's still expensive, so you must be lying when you say it's gonna make it more affordable. And you say, well, just be patient. There will be some short-term benefits, but in, give it 10 or 15 years, it's gonna be great. And it's gonna be great for your kids. <laughs> that, as a politician who will be termed out by the time you know, this gets resolved. It's a really, it's hard. But it is one of those, it's a political situation where you have to inspire people to think long-term. Say, so we're going to take short-term steps to triage, to make sure people aren't getting pushed out, to make sure that people are stable. We're going to do that. We're gonna move as fast as we can to build supportive housing for the homeless and so forth. But we have to stay the course for a long period of time. And I think it's also, one last thing it's important to understand, people sometimes have a perception, wow, we're going so gangbuster on housing. And it's true, we've done, there have been a lot of great work done locally in San Francisco and San Diego and LA, rezoning. But if you look at actual housing production in California, it's actually been going down. We should be at 180 or so thousand units a year. In 2016, and Liam will correct me if I'm wrong, in 2016, we built about 85,000 units of housing. In 2017, it went down to 80,000. And last year, it was 77,000. I'm not sure if that's net, but by the permit number, it's a little bit over 100. Right, but, but in, terms still, of what was, in terms of what was actually built, it was 77,000 units of housing last year. Okay. Maybe the net, but I don't want to. Yeah, and yeah, it's been. But yeah, yeah. So, uh -huh. so but regardless, yeah. where it's not like all of a sudden we've been exploding our housing production. And it's not just because of zoning or NIMBYism. There, we have major issues with house construction costs. We have a major construction worker shortage that's been exacerbated by uh, this president's immigration policies. The cost of goods have gone, the cost of materials has gone up. The tariffs have made it worse. We have a lot of <clears throat> cost issues as well. Um, yeah, you see a lot of the cranes down in, in San Diego, downtown San Diego building residential right now, but those residential units are not affordable to the people who work in downtown San Diego. So, for instance, I work downtown, I'm not going to be able to afford a $2 million unit, even though I'd love to be able to do that. Um, so, part of the problem is the, the type of units that are being built, too, but a lot of that has to do with, with the cost of construction from the from the, the developer's perspective, that's about where they need to build in order to be able to make some type of a profit. So being able to actually build affordable housing really is, uh, it's, it's a big problem in this, in this region right now. And just to 
be explicit, we need to be increasing funding for affordable housing like now, like last, like many years ago. Um, we need to be building subsidized affordable housing because even if we had all the housing built, then we never had a, a, a lag in the last 30, 50 years. There will always be people who need to have subsidized housing. So I don't think any of us, at least on the left, are arguing that this is purely like a, a, a capitalist solution. We need to have affordable subsidized housing, but you know, uh, there's a lot of us who would not qualify even if there was enough affordable housing for everyone So that's why we also need to be building the um, the market rate housing for um, the rest of us uh, I just have a quick data point yeah. to build on just sort of um, Something that I've been uh, thinking about recently as I look at the permitting numbers for the city of San Diego and the 4,000 units that were constructed in San Diego last year development services department is booming, my staff works nonstop. What are they working on? Well, they're working on some residential uh, new development, but a whole host of existing residential remodels and additions. And if it's not an accessory dwelling unit or granny flat, and they're just adding on an extra bedroom, but not permitting it as a junior unit, we're not actually counting that towards any additional housing, but those are real people moving into those bedrooms. And so that's something that I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper into because we really are doing a ton of that work, none of which is being reported to the state or captured for um, additional housing opportunities. So I'm gonna ask uh, one more question, and then I think we'll have time maybe for a couple audience questions, but I wanna, if someone can help me with passing this mic around. Um, but I wanna be very clear, uh, audience questions, not audience comments, and if people have a comment, not a question, please don't, I will be mean to you. Um, so um, here, here is my question uh, for everybody. Um, so what does a San Diego or a California that has the kind of housing production you'd like to see look like? Yeah, as the housing supply increase that you would like to see, what does a San Diego look like? What does a California look like that has the sort of housing abundance um, that, that, that you would like to see? I, I think we have to talk about when we say what a community or a state looks like, and this ties into the conversations about neighborhood character. Um, it's so important, I think, always to keep in mind the neighborhood character, we, we tend to think of it as it's about the physicality of the neighborhood, what's the design, the heights, you know, what, what does it look like when you look around? And that's important, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's also about the people who live there. And so when we protect quote unquote neighborhood character by saying we don't want anything to look different, that you might be very successful in doing that, and we have been in many communities, but people get pushed out, just priced out, and you end up <clears throat> having um, less diversity of all types uh, in that community and your character has changed. So California of the future, um, I don't think it has to be the land of mega high rises everywhere. I think you can have modest increases in density um, that, that aren't even that dramatic, but just more flexibility in allowing different kinds of housing and you can add a huge amount of new housing that way. So not having profound changes for what a community looks like but more modest changes, and if you do that all over, it can have a big impact, and what that will mean is, in terms of what California looks like, we will continue to look like what we've always been, which is a state where people can move here and make lives for themselves, whether it's from out of the country and immigrate here or from other parts of the United States. We'll continue to be a place where we foster innovation and creativity and have artists and where teachers can live in the communities where they teach um, and where young people um, can like move back to the town where they grew up. So I, I think in that aspect too, we will hopefully look like what California has always prided ourselves in terms of what we're about. For me, what it looks like is um, you know, creating housing for the population of the future. And we need to, we need to really consider that of the 700,000 new people that will be here in San Diego, about a half a million of those will be age 65 plus. So we're going to be living longer and the population is aging too. So the type of housing that you need for people who are 65, 75, 85, 95 years old and, and, and still active in the future is, is really something that we need to look at. 
And you know, at Sandag, one of the things that we're, we're doing with the five big moves is to really look at these mobility hubs that would be all throughout the entire region, where you would have higher density housing and jobs co-located around a transportation hub. And, and these type of more forward-looking concepts are really what uh, need to be built. We need to build 15 to 20,000 units uh, a, a year for the next foreseeable future in order to overcome the deficit we, that we have right now. So really rethinking land use and, and being able to figure out how are we going to meet the, the state mandated goals and how are we going to create quality of life within the region I think is, is really important. And, and one way to do it is to, is to densify around mobility hubs. Um, I think that you're going to see uh, a lot of innovation in how people live. Um, we are already starting to have projects come forward um, and finding out about projects where we don't have those things in our code yet. We're not exactly sure. Like, for example, um, like co-living or cooperative living, you're going to see a lot more people um, sh who share one kitchen but have their own space and have communal space. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. You're going to see a lot of smaller units, micro units, where people live, people without kids perhaps, are living in more studio environments, a lot more so than currently in San Diego. You're going to see a lot of different construction and materials types. You are going to see houses made out of things you probably didn't think houses could be made out of. Um, and so uh, the look and feel of what all of that looks like is going to change dramatically. Um, I can tell you we're also going to be seeing a lot more people doing things like um, instead of just sharing scooters, it's going to be the next thing is going to be shared mopeds. I'm telling you, put bank on it right now. Shared mopeds are going to be everywhere. <laughs> um, so there's really going to be a lot of innovation. And I think that where we get back to that single family challenge is you will see people coming out like in full force saying, we're not ready to accept this change, but you're going to have politicians who are say, we have to innovate. We have to start the change now. We can't do things the way that we did the last 50 years. And I'll just add that when, when there is ultimately enough housing and it's affordable at all income levels, um, and we have subsidized housing as well as market rate housing or who knows even public housing I, that that For that to happen. It will also have to happen side by side with alleviating poverty and making sure that people have um, are uh, Have a living wage and are able to take care of themselves we, we need to find a place for our homeless neighbors to live and I think it, it just goes alongside with um, having people get out of poverty and uh, into middle class lifestyles. So we're actually running really low on time, so I am going to allow two questions, but please let's make them questions and, and uh, direct it to, to one or two folks. Sir, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the cost of housing has been brought up as one of the, the uh, impediments to uh, creating affordable. Has anyone ever looked at it, and I used to build affordable and finance affordable for many years, has everyone ever looked at the codes and, and ways that we could build housing, revise the building codes to, uh, you know, to allow cheaper materials staying with healthy self and safety, but to a way of building housing cheaper? It, it seems like we never look at that side of the equation. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I think that is definitely a focus, and we see it with the trend towards exploring modular housing or cross-laminated timber instead of steel, and it's all very controversial at times. But um, I think also, and this is a really hard one, um, I say this as an ardent environmentalist and someone who has participated in this effort, uh, we, have, we want our buildings to be as green as possible. And so there's Title 24 of the State Building uh, Code that has all sorts of requirements to make buildings as green as possible and moving towards now carbon uh, neutrality. And that's all great, and I've been supportive of that and I have participated in that effort. But in the aggregate, when we talk about costs and housing, if you're, there is an open question. If you're building an apartment building right on top of a BART station, if I could be Bay Area centric for the moment, um, uh, should you maybe get a little relief from that? Because what you're doing is inherently so profoundly um, you know, anti-climate change. Um, th that's super controversial, and, but I think it's something we have to at least uh, talk about because that, that does add significant costs, although there are significant benefits of having greener buildings. 
Sir, here. Okay. Um, hi there. So, uh, name's Frank. I am here to ask you a question. So, if we're going to talk about the new um, ho um, housing crisis and, you know, basically about um, the future on how we're going to place all these new homes and all these new zonings, so what's gonna also going to be the fate, you know, of, of course, you know, of, of the different schools? Like, how are we going to make sure that all the schools, you know, are, you know, are basically going to be treated fairly? And how are we going to make sure that there is no, um, you know, like, imbalance? Like, we can't have communities, you know, like, where the schools are basically, like, um, how, how do I put this? Oh, you know, like, uh, we can't have low-income schools versus high-budget schools. So the point is, how are we going to make sure that all of this is going to be fair and distributed equally? Well, I think that's a big part of um, the movement that we're doing here with the UMB Democrats is that we need to be, once again, desegregating our neighborhoods so that people of all income levels can live and attend high quality schools and um, bring, bring schools that are in other neighborhoods up to the same standard. You know, there's neighborhoods now that are closing down their elementary schools because families are leaving, because families can't afford to live in those neighborhoods anymore. We're literally closing schools. So uh, I think the whole, the whole idea is to elevate everyone's quality of life and living by making housing more affordable at all income levels, um, by building enough housing, over time making it more affordable, having a healthy ecosystem of housing where over time when we have enough housing that's been built over every single year at a steady pace that we can all afford to live in, um, in the neighborhoods we choose near good schools, near our jobs. Okay, hopefully uh, folks can stay after a little bit. If folks in the audience have questions, there is some more time, but uh, they we're running low now, so thank you very much uh, to all our panelists. <laughs>